Amen. Man, what a privilege and an opportunity to be able to share the Word of God with you today. And even more than that, to be able to be in His presence. Amen. To be able to worship Him, to be able to lift up a praise to Him. I want to thank the pastors of this house who also so happen to be my wonderful father and mother-in-law. My mother-in-law is here today. And can we give her a hand? How many of you... How many of you would like to hear more from her? Yeah, teaching and preaching. I'm going to leave that right there. But I'm just saying, there's a word inside of her that needs to come out. Amen. If you agree with that, say amen. Amen. Okay, the eyes have it. I want to jump into the word of God. If you follow me on social media, you know, I recently created a Facebook account and Instagram account to post on what's happening with Circle Church and I've been posting devotionals on there and this past week I was in the one year Bible and I posted a devotional short video on Isaiah the book of Isaiah and I told those of you who follow me on social media that I was going to be picking up with that word today and speaking the rest of that word and I will but today's not the day (laughs) as it often happens last night I was in prayer and the Holy Spirit completely redirected me to another message and I want you to know I don't get to choose what I speak on I'm his vessel so if the morning of I'm walking out on the stage and it's happened before and he says you're not preaching that today you're preaching this it's gonna happen whatever he wants is gonna happen and so today the sermon that he gave me for you and I will preach that passage in Isaiah at some point whether it's online or here next time I preach but the sermon that I have for you today is called strategic warfare strategic warfare. It's the the word that God put in my spirit last night as I was pacing my property at midnight. I was just seeking him. And actually, I heard the Lord say the words, no more secret warfare. The devil wants to keep you contained in a secret warfare that goes on inside of your mind where you can't have reinforcements. You can't have uh, uh, the body of Christ coming around you. We're going to deal with that in a little bit when we get into it. But today, we're going to talk about strategic warfare. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, and we're starting 6, 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So the first step, the first strategy in our warfare is understanding that we are in a war. We have to wake up and we have to understand that while we are in this world, we are not of this world. We are from another dimension. We're extraterrestrials. We're we're living in these earthly bodies, but there's something inside of us that is in touch with another realm. We are in a war, people. And the sooner we wake up and realize that, the sooner we can get to work doing what God has called us to do. There is a gospel of ease that is being preached from the pulpits of America. It's a gospel that says, just sit back and relax It's a gospel that says God wants you to be prosperous. God wants you to be comfortable. God wants you to have a big house with a white picket fence and a perfectly mowed lawn. And while all those things are wonderful and we should enjoy those things, the Bible also says that we will experience tribulation, hardship, difficulty. How is it possible that we worship a Savior, but we think that we don't have to go through difficulty after what he went through for us? We will face hardship. And that's why we have to understand this is a war. There's a battle raging right now, whether you want to see it or not. And I believe prophetically we are coming into a day and age where you can no longer ride the fence. That's not going to be an option. You will have to pick a side in this battle. You will have to pick a side in this war. And every person in this place, you have an assignment in this war. You've been called as God's soldiers. You cannot stand idly by because if we do not pick the side of Almighty God, a side will be assigned to us. The the, the option of being in between the church and sometimes in the church and sometimes in connection with God, but other times you're not living for God and then you go, that's over. 
That's over. It's time to walk in the fullness of what God has called us to do. So first thing, number one, understanding that there is a war and that we are in it. Luke 16, 19 through 26 says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. That's nice. It's nice to live in luxury. It's nice to have soft sheets and enjoy the finer things in life, isn't it? At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham from far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue before, because of my agony. I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides, all this between us and you is a great chasm that has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us? That is a depiction of what is in store for every person, every human being. You have an eternal fate. The question is, which of the two is the depiction of your life? Which one will be your future? Will you hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Because the Bible says that there will be many who will say, I cast out demons in your name. I healed the sick in your name. Okay, so that's not talking about the good casual church going. That's talking about ministers of the gospel of Jesus that have cast out demons. That have, and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. That's a scary thought. And while this is something that is not preached much in church today, it's something that I grew up hearing in the church my whole life. I had such a fear of hell, fire, and brimstone that it kept me on the straight and narrow for a while. But it seems like back then it was so much more prevalent in the church. There were songs that were written about it. There were songs that were written about God coming back in his wrath and destroying evil and all these things. And now it's like there's this, there's this lax, just do what you want. Everybody's accepted. Everybody, we, 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 you know, it, we, we, we want to not turn people away, so we say things that appeal to every. I've heard ministers of the gospel on massive platforms saying things like, my whole thoughts on homosexuality and the homosexual lifestyle, it's all changing, it's evolving, because as times evolve, we have to evolve our mentalities and our way of thinking and all of these things that are being said. This is a war, people. It's a war for your soul and for the souls around you. We have to understand that. Number two, be strong in the Lord. Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We can't be weak. We have to stand up and be the strong Christ followers that he's called us to be. We cannot allow ourselves to be mowed over. We can't be sheepish. We can't be fearful. We have to be strong in what God has called us to do. Amen? Amen. Can I tell you what strength is not? Strength is not isolation from others. Many times we think we can't share things with fellow Christians in the body of Christ because we think that it's a sign of weakness. If I tell them what I'm dealing with, they're going to think I'm weak. That's not strength at all. Strength is leaning on the people that God has put in your life to surround you, to encourage you, to pray for you. That's why God put them there. The devil wants to isolate you away from everybody so that he can wreak havoc on your mind, your thought life, right? He wants to isolate you so that you're not around anybody else and you're trying to deal with this thing that is. And as I was walking and praying last night, the Lord said, no more silent warfare. So as the devil puts things in here, the way we counteract them is with this. We have to speak out against those things using the word of God. We have to use the word of God as our weapon against the thoughts that the enemy puts in our mind. We cannot try and combat him back with our thoughts. You can't use a thought to cast out a thought. You need to use the word of God, spoken word of God out of your mouth. That's why I'm driving sometimes. I know people think I'm crazy because I'm driving sometimes and a thought will come into my mind. I'll say, that's not mine. I bind that in the name of Jesus. I don't receive that thought. And I speak it out. People are driving by like, what's wrong with that guy? And I'm like, got this intense look on my face. They're thinking, man, someone's getting chewed out on the phone or something, you know. 
I'm chewing out the devil, man. You're not going to put that thought in my mind. I cast you out in the name of Jesus. Get out of this car. You don't even have a right to be in this car. There's angels surrounding this vehicle. Get back where you belong. You got to use your mouth to combat the thoughts. Don't use thoughts to combat thoughts. Hear me today. That's a word someone needs to grab a hold of. Don't use thoughts to combat thoughts. Use your mouth and use the word of God that he's given you as a weapon. Man, I feel the power of God. John 16, says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. What? I thought we were going to have success. I thought we were going to have happiness. I thought we were going to have peace. I thought we were going to have all the good things. No, it says you're going to receive tribulation. You're going to go through it. And there's not one amen, and that's good. There shouldn't be an amen, because we shouldn't want the tribulation, but it's going to happen. That's what the word of God says. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Wow. You know, it's interesting. He says, I have overcome the world. I want you to notice and zero in on that terminology. It doesn't say, I have befriended the world, and we're buddies now, and you're good. Do whatever you want to do because I'm a friend of the world. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, I have mastered the balance between the gospel and culture and I have merged the two together and now you can have the culture of the world and the church because I'm a friend of the world. It doesn't say that. It says, I have overcome the world. It insinuates a battle. It insinuates and and, and implies a war. I have overcome the world. The world will not receive you for the spirit of truth is not in the world. They couldn't receive me, the spirit of truth. So how is it that we can think for a moment that we are supposed to do and say and act like the world so that we can reach the world? Let me be more worldly so that I can reach the world. Let me reduce my standard of holiness and go out and partake of the things that the sinners are doing so that I can reach them. You know, and and those types of people like to use the argument, well, Jesus was in the bars. He was hanging out with the people. He was was right there in the middle of them. Yeah, and he wasn't doing half the stuff that you're doing. He wasn't partaking of the evil. He was getting rid of the evil. The power of Jesus, wherever he went, he was healing the sick. He was casting out demons. Demons trembled when he walked into a bar. The satanic spirits begin speaking out when he walked into a place. So don't think Jesus was in the club hanging out, having some drinks and dancing with everybody and cursing and using profanity. And that's your way of trying to justify what you're doing to make yourself feel better. I'm not religious. I'm not legalistic. No, no, no. Don't be deceived. God is a holy God. And we are to live according to his word. Number three, understand what we are battling against. Strategy number three, understand what we are battling against. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12, it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. Another translation says the strategies of the devil. How many know that if he has strategies, we should have strategies? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Let me say that again for those of you who interacted with your brothers and sisters from the first service this morning in the parking lot. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. For those of you who will be in the Chick-fil-A drive through on your way to work tomorrow, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we have to understand and identify that there are principalities that take control of flesh and blood. So there are some people that are being assigned to you to disrupt you, to to ruin your peace, to get you into the flesh. And rather than engage with those people, you have to engage with the stronghold that is at work in those people. You have to engage with the spirit that is influencing those people, not to their face. Don't go up to them and say, I rebuke you. Throw holy water on them. No, that's a good way to get you arrested. What you do is you just say, okay, have a great day. God bless you. And then when you get in your car, I bind every satanic stronghold. I bind every uh, uh, assignment of the enemy that has been sent to rob my peace today. 
I recognize that that person was being used by the enemy to provoke me and I cancel every plan that the devil has for the rest of the day and the rest of the week to try and take my peace, to try and provoke me to anger because I don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Devil, do you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? I wrestle against you and all your little minions by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't send people my way. And you just begin to engage in that with authority because you know who your God is. You know who's living inside of you. You know, my, my wife and I were praying the other day and we just felt like she got the word that there were these, the, these, these principalities over the region that God has called us to plant Circle Church. And let me back up a little bit and tell you, Circle Church is gonna happen. I said it a little bit in the first service and I don't have time to get into all of it, but God has had us in this holding pattern, this holding cell. I'm going to use the word cell because it's been a prison. God has had us in this, in this immobility, this state of just, just waiting on him. And it's been the most frustrating season of my life because I'm thinking, God, I'm stepping out of this into something bigger. I'm just being real with you. I thought, you know, I'm executive pastor here, but God is now calling me to be lead pastor. So I'm, I'm stepping up, right? That's what my thought was. God is taking me out of his position to elevate me. And so when I, when I was leaving Life Source, I'm thinking I'm taking a step up, but can I show you what was actually happening as I left this position, this platform, which I love and cherish so much. It's so incredible to be with you every time I have the opportunity. This was actually what was happening. I was... And over the last eight months to a year of my life, God has obliterated me. I mean, destroyed me, destroyed me. And I came out of this season of my life thinking, I'm executive pastor. I'm ordained by God for the work of the ministry. And I had no idea all the things that were inside my life that God said, the only way I can get them out is by breaking you. Is by breaking the little kingdom that you built that you think is so good and showing you that no good thing can come from you. It can only come from me. And so over the last year, when I set out to start Circle Church, I had a lot of money in my bank account. I mean, a lot of money. I'm talking more money than most people can save up in their entire lifetime in my bank account. And I thought, I'm going to use these resources to build Circle Church. God called me. Look at me. What a saint. I would take all that hard-earned money and put that into the kingdom of God, right? I'm going to take it. And God said, you're not building squat. And over the last year, God has not even allowed me to work in my business. I've been, I have been on such a supernatural standstill. I try and work on something. I try and start new business ventures. I try and work on the ministry. And God has frustrated all of my efforts to bring me to nothing. Nothing. No more money, no more position of influence, no more anything, no more authority, no more resources, no more friends, nothing. And I've been like, God, what is happening here? Fighting it, fighting it, fighting it. All the while, thank God for a man of God named John Bevere. I don't know if you know who that is, but I encourage you, look up his teaching. He wrote a book called God, Where Are You? And it talks about the wilderness season that every man and woman of God must go through in order for God to promote you. And so we, we, want, we want the glory, we want the position, we want the gift, but many times we make an idol out of those things. We come into his presence and say, fill me up so that I can go out and do what I really want to do, which is ministry rather than seeking his face and an intimate relationship with him. And nothing can be built unless he builds it. If God doesn't build it, it's not going to happen. And so I have literally, this is just a tiny, I'm going to get in depth about this process with you at one point when I preach. Today's not the day, but I'm going to share in depth and in nitty gritty detail everything that we've been through and how horrible it's been, but yet how amazing it's been at the same time. But God spoke the word, and so we started feeling two weeks ago, we're like, we're coming out of this wilderness season. After completely being emptied out, depleted, no money left, no ministry, no nothing, and I would sit down to even start writing the bylaws for Circle Church. I'm writing the bylaws, and, and I'm writing, I gotta get board members, I gotta, I gotta register the nonprofit, things that I know how to do that I used to do in my sleep, and I couldn't even write a simple document. Like, all my thoughts would get disheveled, and I couldn't even concentrate on what I was trying. I'm like, God, if I'm not doing business, then I'm doing ministry. Let me do something. 
God said, no, you're not doing anything. No, you're not doing anything. You're stuck. Until you learn what I want you to learn, until you crucify that pride, until you realize that I'm doing a work in you that only I can do, until you are completely obliterated and there's nothing left, you will not get out of this wilderness season. And someone needs to hear the sound of my voice today. God is doing something in you. That's why your efforts are being frustrated. God has a purpose for you. That's why he will not let your earthly efforts succeed until you submit to him until you're broken, until there's nothing left, until you can pray the prayer with sincerity. Lord, I return praise for hardship. That sounds pretty, right? It makes me sound really spiritual. It makes me sound really holy. But you have to get to the place where you mean it, where you have nothing left. And you say, God, all this stress that I'm going through, I return worship for it. I return praise, not because it sounds good, but because I genuinely mean it. I return worship. I thank you for this wilderness. I thank you for what you've taught me in this. I thank you for what you're teaching me. I thank you that this won't be the only wilderness. There will be more to come. But two weeks ago, God spoke to us and said, you're coming out of the wilderness. It's time to run. It's time to go. And so I'm like, okay, Lord, that sounds great, but I have no resources now. I have no financial backing. I have no influence. I don't even barely have friends. Most of the people that text me, they text me because they want something. It went from when I was up here on this pulpit, Pastor David, you have such an incredible ministry. I'm praying for you. God bless you, brother. Oh, God's hand is on. And then I'm gone, and then the text messages stop. I'm gone, and then the only texts I get are, hey, would you mind taking care of this leaky faucet? And Would you mind? It's, 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 and that is, listen, I am not, I, I want you to hear the spirit that that's coming from. That's God's work. That's God's supernatural design. So when God spoke to us and said, you're coming out of this, I said, all right, let's go. She said, there's principalities. God spoke to Brooke and said, there's principalities hovering over this region in the airwaves that don't want this message to go through. Because I'm planting an online church. Eventually, we're going to have campuses. We're going to have locations all over the world. It's going to be wonderful. But it's starting online. And I need to tell you something this morning. God revealed to me that the people that control that are under the influence of the enemy. What do I mean that? What am I talking about? I'm talking about the airwaves. I'm talking about the multimedia. I'm talking about telecommunications. I'm talking about all of the networks. There is an agenda from Satan to, to feed narratives to the world through the multimedia. So for us to try and plant a church that is built on that infrastructure, it's not going to be easy. The devil's going to launch every attack that he's got, and that's what he did. We started praying. We bind every principality of darkness. We come against them in Jesus' name. We say, release the work of God. And that day, that was a Monday two weeks ago, I became so attacked in my mind by the enemy. And we even prayed. We felt that it was coming. We said, we, we counteract every spirit of retaliation of the enemy. We, we pray for protection. But I got such an attack on my mind like you wouldn't believe. I mean, the devil, all hell broke loose because the devil could sense we were coming out of this season. We had been dormant. We had been inactive and we had been seemingly so, but God was doing something in us. And now the devil began to sense that we were stepping out into the call of God and all hell broke loose. I mean, crazy thoughts in my mind. You're, you're going crazy. Look at your trajectory. You're losing your mind. They're going to come visit you in Shepherd Pratt because... Look at you. How could you throw away all that wealth? How could you throw away all, oh man, I feel the power of God. How could you throw away all these? And all these thoughts started bombarding my mind. You're going to lose your mind. You're going to lose it. You're going to be insane. You're, gonna, you're already insane. Look at what you're doing. You're throwing everything. And I, I just went to prayer and I got on my face before the Lord in the guest room of our house. And I just started crying out, God, it's just me and you, God. It's just me and you, God. And the, the attacks would subside and then they'd come back. And so I got on the phone and I called these prophets right here on the front row. And I said, I'm not beyond help. The kings of old would consult the prophets for direction from God. I said, I need direction. I need reinforcements. I need supernatural help here. And God had already given Dr. Constance and Nelly a word that morning when I called. The Lord had spoken to her the word psychological warfare. That morning, so much so that she typed it into the intercessor's chat. She said, God is calling us to deal with psychological work. So when I called her, she already knew what was coming. She already, God had already prepped her for that. She began prophesying and speaking words. How can you be exalted before you are broken? God is breaking you. You have passed the test. And she began to give me all of these words of freedom. And she says, and this issue of the psychological warfare, do not even engage in the battle. The Spirit of the Lord says that it would be a waste of your time to even engage in the battle, for he will fight the battle. 
and he will win it. And when I walked out of that room, those tormenting spirits were gone and they have not come back since. Can someone give glory to God? So we're going to give you the full story and all the details of our journey and what's been happening. But I want you to know that over the last year, I have not been giving up. I haven't been dormant by my own accord. I've been trying to do the work, but I've realized only in the last couple months that this has been a sovereign, God-ordained season of our lives. Now, though, he's given us the green light, so we're running. Full steam ahead, we're running. What does that mean? I don't know what it means. I don't have the resources. But God told us we were going to plant a church in the woods of our property. So I plan on getting one of these right here, and I'm going to stick it in the woods of our property and I'm going to begin worshiping and I'm going to begin lifting up praise. You will see me. Listen to me. You're going to think I'm crazy. You probably already do, but you're going to see me online because I'm going to get a camera crew out there in the woods and I'm going to get... Oh my Lord, I'm going to begin declaring the word of God because he spoke it, not me. He said the word of God would go forth from that property. And he said that people would hear the word and they'd be set free. So even if it's just me and a pulpit, baby, I'm going to be in there preaching the word of God in those woods. Hallelujah. Because I know it won't just be me. I know the Holy Spirit will be right there with me. So the warfare, we have to understand as I bring this thing to a close today, there's principalities of darkness. And I'm going to make these notes available because there's no way I can get through all of it today. There are principalities of darkness. A principality is a state ruled by a prince. So that deals with geographic locations. There are strongholds that have governing power over geographic locations. And we have to understand that as we go and engage in warfare, that's exactly what we were dealing with was a principality over the region where we're starting this church. And so as we began to engage in warfare and engage in battle, That principality was riled up and sent all the forces of hell, but they were defeated and they will continue to be defeated. There's powers, powers. What kind of powers is it talking about? It's the Greek word exousia, which is power, authority, weight, especially moral authority or influence. And when I see that word influence, it makes me think of social media influencers. In order to be an influencer on social media, there is certain criteria that you have to abide by. It's called algorithms. And if you do not fit the mold and you do not post exactly what they want you to post, when they want you to post it, and it doesn't look how they want you to make it look, you are not eligible to be an influencer on their platform. Oh, hear me today. You may think, oh, this guy's a lunatic. He's, he's into all kinds of spiritual, over-spiritualization. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. There are strongholds of darkness that do not want the word of God to go forth over the airwaves. And so if we have to create new airwaves, I don't know what God's going to do, but the word of God is going to get out. The word of God is going to go forth. Rulers, a ruler of this world, that is the ruler, that is the word, the world as asserting its independence of God, used of angelic or demonic powers controlling the sublunary world. There's an agenda that is moving this nation away from God. Wake up, people. Ask God to open your eyes. Open our eyes, Lord. We've got to see that there is a demonic, satanic agenda that is moving this nation away from the godly principles upon which it was founded. They're rulers of darkness of this age, and they change and evolve with each age. That's why it says of this age. This age looks different, but it's the same agenda. It's packaged differently, but it's the same mission. These rulers of darkness... And there is a wickedness that has been disguised as good. There's a wickedness that has been released that if you do not partake of, and not just partake, but celebrate, if you don't celebrate the wickedness, you're a bigot, you're hateful. You can look, you just, just look. Look at all of the major corporations. Every other religion, every other walk of life, every other agenda is celebrated. Buddhists, Muslims even. I mean, have you read the Quran? How did that, how do Muslims make the cut? But you see them like in, in corporate commercials for cell phones. Like, but Christians don't make the cut. That is because there is a lifelong 
reality, and that is that he was in this world but not accepted by the world. They crucified him. We have to stop striving to be accepted by the world and understand that to be yoked with Christ is to be rejected by the world, even possibly to the point of martyrdom. Would we be willing to die for the cause? Many people have before us. I don't know what the future holds. I like to believe that's not my fate, but Lord, if it is, Apostle Paul said to live is Christ and to die is gain. Wickedness disguised as good. For false Christs and prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. That's talking about me and you, people who cast out demons, the people. There's a spirit that will be loose to deceive people. Put on the whole armor of God. That's point number four, strategy number four for strategic warfare. Put on the whole armor of God. And I'm going to quickly read what that is. Ephesians 6, 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. We need a spirit of truth to discern what is not right. Having put on the, bless, the breastplate of righteousness. We need to be clothed in righteousness and get rid of the filth, get rid of the sin. As Pastor Becky was talking about, close the doors to the things that are trying to come in that don't belong. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith. Ooh, it says above all. That says that that is more important than any of the other items. Why does it say that? Why does the Apostle Paul specify above all? Why? Because the word says without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he is what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That he is almighty God. C.S. Lewis talks about, and I'm going to butcher the quote, but you can't say that he was just a good prophet. You have to pick. Either he was a lunatic, crazy, or he was God. He is God. You, you don't get the choice. Many people want to say, oh, Jesus was good. He was, he was a good prophet. He did good things on the earth. But you, you can't say that because he professed that he was God. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So what was he, a lunatic or is he God? You have to choose one or the other, and we know that he is almighty God. So we have to have faith. Faith is the foundation with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation. Yeah, protects your mind, guards your mind, guards your spirit. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's what I was just talking about. We've got to speak out the word. That's the sword. That's how we do battle. That's how we fight. That's the offensive strategy. It's the sword of the spirit. Amen? Number five, pray in the spirit. Oh man, I had a whole teaching in here on that but I'm not going to get to it. Number six, and lastly, as we close, we have to speak boldly. Speak boldly. Look at Ephesians 6, 19. It says, and for me, that utterance may be given to me. This is Apostle Paul asking for prayer. That I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. This is the boldest man that ever walked the planet asking for prayer that he would be bold to speak what God has told him to speak. In chains. Because at the time of this writing, he was in prison. And we get offended when someone has a contrary opinion on Facebook and comments and says, I don't like that. This man was in chains. And he said, help me to be more bold. Pray that God would help me be more bold. I need to speak the word of God with more boldness. We need to speak out the truth with boldness. We can't shy back anymore. There's souls at stake. Break off every man-pleasing spirit in this place, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, that we would be bold ambassadors, that even if it costs us our freedom on this earth, even if we're in chains, we'll be in chains declaring your word boldly, without fear, without intimidation, oh, God. I thank you, Lord. We don't fear mere men. 
For we know the God who has called us. So what do we do? How do we speak out in truth? I'm going to give you some examples right here. That I have to speak as a representative of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have to speak these things. I don't have a choice. It's the word of God. You may not like it, but you can take it up with the word. So first and foremost, I'm going to make this prophetic declaration on behalf of the church. And I'm not talking about life source. I'm not on staff anymore. I'm talking about the church as a whole the body of Christ as a minister of the gospel because while I don't work for life source we're still one family I'm still of you and you are of me we're together we're just as united as when I was executive pastor so I need you to pray for me like the apostle Paul said pray for me that I'd speak the word in boldness we love every transgender person with the unconditional love of Christ but we do not agree with the lifestyle of transgenderism According to Psalm 139, 14, which says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I've already been fearfully and wonderfully made. Therefore, I don't have to take matters into my own hand. Look at the next part. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. See, at the core and at the root of transgenderism is confusion. It's a confusion of identity. It's a confusion of, did God really get it right when he made me or should I take matters into my own hands? It's confusion. And God wants to speak clarity into your life. He wants you to know you are fearfully and wonderfully made just as you are. You were handcrafted and hand designed by God. And if there's anyone under the sound of my voice in this room or watching that is dealing with these thoughts and these feelings of transgenderism I want you to know that the church has its doors open this is a place with the loving arms of Christ open come give us everything that you have tell us everything tell us how you're feeling we want you we love you because Jesus first loved you Jesus first loved us in our confusion in our difficulty in our iniquity number two we love every homosexual with the unconditional love of Christ, but we do not, hear me as the body of Christ, we do not agree with the lifestyle of homosexuality. According to 1 Corinthians 6, 9, which says, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men will inherit the kingdom of God. That's the word of God. And we, we, we can't change God's word to fit our narratives and our desires. It's not up to us. All we can do is preach it and trust him enough to know that maybe if he created all of humanity, he knows what he's talking about. Number three, we love every person who has had, is contemplating, or will have an abortion with the unconditional love of Christ. But we believe that abortion is murder of an innocent, voiceless human being. According to Jeremiah 1.5, which says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That indicates to me that God sees life happening before it even enters the womb. So the unformed fetus, God sees it as life because he had plans for it before it even entered the womb. So any confusion that you have on the matter, let it be settled now. God saw you before you were in your mother's womb and he chose you. He chose you. So as the body of Christ, we must speak up. We thank God and pray continually for our elected government officials, but we recognize and refuse their agenda to remove Christianity from our nation. And we use it as an example of this, Daniel chapter three, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were told to bow down before the other gods and they refused to do so. We will not bow down to any God but Jehovah. We will not bow our knee to any idols. The idol of culture, 
the idol of the acceptance of evil. We will not bow down our knees. We will stand strong as the church of Christ. We take a stand for our children and say that we will not allow them to be indoctrinated by an anti-Christ narrative. They will be raised upon the foundation of the Word of God according to Proverbs 22, 6, which says, raise up a child in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. Stand on your feet all over this place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Oh, thank you, God, for your word. Father, I pray that a spirit of boldness would come upon your church. God, a spirit that is unwilling to relent, a spirit, God, that is unwilling to give up, a spirit, oh God, that says, no matter what my condition is, I will follow you. God, whether you heal me or not, I will follow you. God, whether you give me breakthrough or not, I will follow you. See, when things like that happen, you're taking the focus, you're shifting the focus off of the idol of your need. Yes, I said idol, off of the idol of your desire. And you're saying, God, this need is not above you. You are above the need. So I put the need on a back shelf and I choose to walk with you. I choose to serve you. I choose to follow you despite my circumstances, despite my situation, despite what I'm going through, I walk with you. And so Father, I pray for a supernatural spirit of clarity. Father, that would come upon your people now, Lord. Right now, let it descend upon your people, God. Open the eyes of your people, mine included, to the the wiles of the enemy, God. Those plans, those schemes of darkness that are so vile and so twisted that they would even try and incorporate themselves with the word of God. They would try and sneak into the church. God, let our eyes be open and let us not be among the elite, the elect that are deceived, God. But let us be, even if it's just a remnant of people, God, who say we refuse to be deceived. We refuse to bow down to Baal. We refuse, oh God, to declare the lordship of any idols. We say that you and you alone are King Jesus. So Father, we give you everything today, all that we are, all that we have. We surrender our life to yours. And I just have to deal with this right now in the spirit. If what I was saying was agitating you, as I was making those declarations, if what I was saying didn't sit well with you, I want you to pray right now. Don't, don't, don't listen to my words. Ask the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit how you should feel about these things. Ask the Holy Spirit if this is the message of truth or not. Okay, don't, don't take it from me. Take it from him and his word. But Father, in the name of Jesus, for every conflicted heart in this place today, I speak clarity right now. I felt that in my spirit. Every conflicted mind in the name of Jesus, I speak clarity as to what we as the body of Christ believe. Not the antichrist spirit, not the false prophets and teachers that will rise with a false doctrine in the end days. God, but the truth of your word, the truth of your spirit, for it is the truth that sets us free. So I thank you, Lord, for clarity upon your people. I thank you, Lord, for every conflicted heart you bring clarity today in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you for showing up in such a mighty way today. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. And I want to leave your people with this word as you go about your week. Worship with no agenda. Praise with no agenda. Put your needs on hold for one week. Hear me today. Put all of your supplications and your requests that have been bombarding heaven. God, I need you to do this. God, I need you to do that. It makes me think of my mother-in-law's chihuahuas. And yes, there's a time for that. The Bible even speaks about it. The unjust judge, that's good. But I hear me today. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying this to us. If you would put all of those things on hold and take one week, I can barely even stand right now, and worship without agenda, worship without a request, worship without a hidden motive, and just praise Him, not because of what's going to happen at the end of the week. 
some of you are already missing it. You're thinking, okay, God, that's the formula. I'm going to do it for one week. One week of worship equals this, and then I'm going to get my need. No, 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 no. You're missing it. Worship for one week and watch what God does in your life as it relates to your relationship with Him. Watch how close you get to Him. Watch how He reveals Himself to you. Watch how the intimacy of your love grows deeper as you push aside the needs and say, yes, Lord, the needs are there. They can wait. I want you. I want you. I'm desperate for you. I worship you. I lift you up. One of the times I was walking my property, the prophets told me, walk your property at midnight every night for four nights. One of the times I was walking the property, I couldn't even pray. I had already decided. I said, okay, God, when I get out in the property this tonight at midnight, I'm gonna, I got a whole list and I know you're going to give me breakthrough because this is the last night of the four nights and I'm going to grab a hold of heaven. And I got out on that property and all I could say was, I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I magnify you, Jesus. For over an hour, that's all that would come out of my mouth. And I realized, okay, my agenda is not grabbing a hold of God for what he can do for me. My only agenda tonight is to lift him up. And so I want to ask you if you would take one week of just lifting him up and saying, I worship you, Jesus. I exalt you, Jesus. Be exalted from this property. Be exalted from this car. Be exalted from this place of work. Be lifted up. Be worshiped. Oh, inhabit the praises of my of us today, God. Inhabit us, Father. Inhabit our worship. Inhabit our love. If you would just do that for one week, I believe God's going to reveal himself to you in such a precious way. So, Father, I commit, I commit to take this week, take this week, to worship without agenda, to praise you without hidden motives, despite what the results might be. Even if nothing changes, as your servant Bob Shore says in the secret of the secret place, the secrets of the secret place, even if it's time wasted, I gladly waste it on my Savior. I take that posture today. And I thank you for your spirit. I bless your people, Father. I pray for favor. I pray for supernatural covering over their coming and their going. God, protect them. Watch them as we go about our week today, this week. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Raise your right hand with me. Have you been blessed this morning? I know I have. I feel refilled. And that's the beautiful thing. When you come into his presence and you just lift him up, he refills you. It is a byproduct. It has to happen. When you exalt him, you have to get filled up. It just happens because the glory of God spills out. And so raise your right hand with me. Say, I am saved. saved. Come on, people. Say it like you know Jesus is in this place right now. Say, I am saved. saved. That's it. I am healed. healed. I am free. I I have the victory. And it's a new season. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us at Life Source Church. We pray that today you found hope and freedom as you experience the power and love of God. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please let us know by clicking the link in the comments below. Again, thank you for joining us and have an incredible week.